Excellent. Thanks a lot, Paul, and thanks everybody for um, uh, the introduction. As we can see, we have different enterprise and various sides of the construction industry, so um, representing the different project stakeholders. And they will tell their story and the viewpoint about the off-site construction specifically for uh, which is the theme for today's discussion, as well as uh, other different topics related to the automation, communication, and how far we're using and utilizing the technology, um, how this impacts the construction industry nowadays. Are we ready for uh, this digital revolution for uh, the construction? So we're going to hear that from uh, the speakers uh, today. So. Um, uh, we have different topics we're going to go through today and we're going to hear from the experts. So, um, um, as we said, the off-site construction is one of the technologies that are uh, disrupting uh, the technology and it will be uh, a trend. Uh, so, we would like to hear, first of all, the definition of the off-site construction. And for this, I would ask uh, uh, Mr. Yasser, uh, who has an extensive knowledge in the um, off-site construction and the modular construction, if you can just give us a quick description of the off-site description and what it means. Uh, well, uh, off-site uh, construction is uh, uh, the term that represents anything you manufacture out of the site in principle. So whatever you do out of the, the construction site can be called off-site uh, uh, construction. Uh, uh, it, you, you can name it, you can start from the brick making, from the, the uh, 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 pre-manufactured uh, doors or windows or whatever it is but such term had been used recently for to represent the the, the amount of uh, uh, activities done out of the site rather than doing them uh, on site under this uh, 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 term uh, it falls the precast falls the modular construction for uh, uh, the the pre-manufactured facade uh, elements and facade systems so off-site off-site construction uh, globally means the activities and the, and the products that you pre-make them out of the site then bring them and, and and install them at site all right thanks a lot for this um, I would also love to hear from Colin, since you also have um, a good knowledge and experience about digitizing, digitizing the construction industry. Uh, obviously, the off-site construction is one of these areas um, that's, that's helping in that sense. So uh, how do you also describe the off-site construction and how you can see? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's to, to build on what uh, Dr. Yes has just mentioned there in terms of everything that is manufactured and and the symbols um, in a component offsite. Um, we then looked at that and try and streamline that um, so that when it's brought to site and, and stood up, we call it, or even assembled, that it's in a much more uh, efficient and uh, and uh, manual manual labor efficient way, right? So what we're looking at at the moment is looking at even traditional designs and looking to those for modularity. So running uh, running various algorithms across that for for modules and then looking at that at a design stage so or even a pre um, pre construction stage um, we believe that that's that's an edge we have in the market and it's feeding into some of the the products and skills we have uh, built uh, particularly in the UK um, we've currently developed a, a very strong solution for the UK housing market which is a which is a term called Edorap so it's everyone deserves a roof over their head um, and that's something we'll be championing here in the UE as well. Right? So it's a, it's it's an offsite uh, zero snag solution for for uh, developing housing. Okay. Uh, my next question, which follows the same uh, theme of the offsite construction, to uh, Mr. Farid from China State. Um, so we all know that the offsite construction has plenty of benefits, like uh, everybody mentioned here, the efficiency predictability, the safety, um, sustainability, less labor and um, less training and no disruption to the clients. Um, so what else from your perspective and your experience you think is a benefit of the off-site construction to the industry? Okay, well, to speak about the benefit, I think your question itself has summarized the, the, the majority aspect which related to this uh, technology, which is the off-site fabrication. Um, in principle, to simplify the understanding of the off-site fabrication, it is uh, just the application of the concept of mass production 
which applied in all the industries mm -hmm. before coming into the construction industry, where you are downstream in the production line and you are setting up all the construction activities within a controlled environment. So from that aspect itself, we need to start from the point of a controlled environment, and especially when we speak about a country like here, like UAE, where we know usually in the summer it's very harsh and it is unsuitable condition to most of the nationalities and especially labors to be productive and uh, bring out our uh, best of their knowledge. When we are able to shift them to a controlled environment, we are totally eliminating that uh, aspect related to the weather condition. So regardless it's raining or it's a burning sun, laborers are working under a controlled environment, are able to produce the best they can do. Uh, at the same time, also we are contr controlling their wastage. And this is a great advantage in order to be efficient and in order to be sustainable as well. The concept of, of, of the uh, offsite fabrication giving us also ability to crash the schedule in the way which is not possible in any other way means if you are going in a conventional way, you need to go sequence by sequence, building floor by floor. But in offsite, you can work on all the floors, all the areas at the same time. And this is a great advantage because this could help the schedule and any other way will not do the same. And if we talk about these days, especially when we are suffering with such condition of pandemic of COVID-19, again, offsite is adding value to give the ultimate control or the only possible control over the social distancing and to minimize the number of labels within site and also minimize the labor movement between emirates and between sites and so all this is added values which all 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 of them need to be accumulated again in the bag of the benefit for the offsite construction activities yes that's uh, excellent i do agree with you and with everybody when it comes to the benefits and the value that the offsite construction can add to the construction industry nowadays um, however, I will just come back to Mr. Yasser and I want to hear from you like um, it's good, but what are the challenges of the offsite construction in the Middle East? If you think you came across different projects and you have implemented the offsite construction and the modular construction for so many projects as a core of your business, but what were the challenges that you came across? If you can share that with us and with everybody as well. Uh, yes, it's very important to understand it. Uh, I, I, will, I will share my, my experience with in, in the two major off-site construction methodologies uh, nowadays. Uh, I'll start with precast, and I'm talking about a slot of, of, of time uh, from 94 till uh, 2008, when the area uh, witnessed the jump of precast uh, uh, industry in the area. At that time, the challenges were uh, about uh, uh, people understanding the benefits of precast, understanding why, and, and I'm addressing here now the clients, and I'm addressing the, the, the contractors who would like to understand why should we, should we go to precast rather than going conventional, uh, especially that they have the, the, the manpower and the manpower is not cost effective, all of those, uh, uh, comes to, to uh, uh, a, a challenge that we used to face to promote the precast industry. However, the boom of construction at that time helped us a lot, and the number of stakeholders in precast, the manufacturers of precast, jumped in uh, from 1994, from seven or ten, in UAE uh, uh, holistically in 1994 to more than 50 around uh, uh, 2007. So that showed the growth of precast. Uh, that couldn't have happened without a real cultural shift in the construction mentality, uh, all name is for the developers, for the consultants, as well as the contractors. A, ve a very similar uh, uh, situation we faced when we started Blue Box in 2012. In 2012, there, there was a big problem internally and externally to justify to people why we should go up to 90% off-site activities compared to, to the rest of them in, in the uh, at site. Yes, uh, uh, the benefits are very clear. We used to promote the benefits. Yes, there are there is lesser manpower at site, lesser disruption to the to the to the boundaries, uh, uh, very high health and safety uh, scores. All of those were okay, but people were still reluctant to 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 take the chance. 
by time, it took us some time, it took us around eight years to reach to, to, to a degree that uh, uh, the Ministry of Housing in Saudi Arabia, for example, nominated uh, modular construction as the best, one of the best options for, for uh, uh, constructing their projects. Uh, now we can see uh, uh, Red Sea, our, our happy client, using modular construction. It's mainly a cultural shift as well as from uh, uh, an operation uh, uh, perspective, the skills of people who used to handle uh, to handle modular construction to to do modular construction and offsite manufacturing you have to have the tools like the software you have to think bim it's another cultural shift towards bim it's uh, uh, the tools are very important and the way you use those tools uh, needs some special skills the market used to lack before now it's getting better and better and i believe these are the main cha challenges Excellent, uh, because this links to the next question. So um, uh, we, you identified like two uh, factors when it comes to the success of the off-site construction as a challenges. So one of them is the, uh, the human uh, factor and the other one is the tool factor. So is the tool ready? Is the tool um, uh, good for the off-site construction? Will it support, let's say, um, as for the women does, Right, so um, let me just repeat the question again. There was a, a problem with the sound and uh, the speakers yeah. weren't able to hear me. Um, so um, we were discussing, and Mr. Yasser mentioned two challenges uh, for the off-site construction. Uh, one of them is the human uh, factor and the other one is the tool uh, side of it. So this links to my next question. So um, I'll be asking um, here, uh, Colin and uh, also Paul Wallet. Uh, so let me start with Paul because you have um, a vast experience in uh, training and helping people to uh, fill the gap between the new technology as well as the implementation of the technology. So um, the construction technology offered by many vendors like yourself um, as a Trimble company at the moment. Um, however, as yester, Mr. Yasser mentioned that there is a skill gap in the local market. Uh, so when it comes to the uh, use of the technology in the construction. So I would like to hear from you. Is there a skill gap that you came across? Uh, do you think that this skill gap will impact uh, the delivery of projects? So please let us know like from your experience. Okay. Um, you can hear me, right? Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, I think there's a couple of challenges here that we have to face. Um, number one, I think if you look at our panelists and maybe myself and a couple of us who've got uh, gray hair coming out and we've been in the industry for you know 30 plus years and what we see throughout the construction industry is uh, a big challenge of you know a quarter or even a you know a third of the workforce is you know over 50 and i think 15% being in the 60s so getting new people into the industry so we've got a lot of people that are coming up to the retirement age. I've got maybe 10, 15 years, and then you know I'll be leaving the industry and relaxing, hopefully. Um, but the big challenge is getting new people, young people into the industry, um, and how the construction industry is also perceived by you know the new uh, people that are coming in. So you know it, it's. It's been painted as like a dirty industry to be in, and a lot of these you know kids now they want to go more into the office job um, and you know have a, a different type of uh, work path to go into. Uh, the advent of technology, there's so many different avenues for younger generations now to go into. Um, you know, it's how do we make the construction industry a interesting and challenging and technology industry for people to go into. Um, so that, that's one big challenge in terms of getting the new workforce. Uh, the second one, obviously, you know, with COVID, we've seen a lot of the skilled workforce through the tough part of the pandemic leave to go back to their home country. So if we talk about the UAE, the Middle East in general, you know, a lot of people did actually leave the country. And with the air corridors being, you know, closed down, getting those people back in to the region is also a challenge. 
Um, on the plus side, though, I think what everybody's experienced is what we're doing to, today here on, the, on this virtual panel. I think, you know, the last 12 months we've seen so many different evolutions in people connecting digitally as opposed to the traditional meetings that you would jump on a plane or, you know, go visit the site. That has changed the whole uh, scope of how we're actually looking to do the work. So a, a lot of offshoring is now from a uh, an en design engineering perspective, a lot of people are looking at offshoring that work. So people can work, you know, remotely with the tools and digitization that we have. So if you couple that with the theme of this particular uh, panel, which is looking at offsite construction and technology in offsite construction, uh, we're minimizing the requirement of a large workforce on the site because we can now uh, look at digitally solving the issues as well as uh, in the physical sense creating you know modules and, and shipping to site so you have a lesser workforce so I think it's a, an interesting time that we're going through in, in how we're really embracing industrial 4.0 in, in the new evolution of how the industry is moving forward Right, excellent. And um, I would I'd like also to hear from Colin, like uh, on your experience with the skills gap, like um, you you for sure came across different projects across the region and also like uh, overseas. So what was your experience when it comes to the skills gap and um, how this impact uh, the project's delivery? Yeah, I, I guess there's, there's three very important uh, aspects that probably are slowing us down and, and maybe we see them as challenges or are hampering us. But I think one is, is labor. Um, I think we still have a, a, a labor cost or a cost base here which can prohibit certain elements of, of modularization and prefabrication. Um, and I think contractors per se are, are slow in making that change at the moment. Um, it's certainly becoming more and more prevalent in, in, in the way we see responses to, to bidding in the current market, but it's still nowhere near where, where one would expect. Um, I mean, for instance, 12 years ago, before I moved to the Middle East, we were heavily involved in, in, uh, in the housing market where we were standing up and doing uh, advanced modular methods of construction for, for, uh, for constructing villas into the UK market at the time for Barrett Homes. So still a bit surprised that that hasn't really taken shape at stealth here in the UAE, but, uh, but I think it's, it's, it's a factor of the construction market and the contractors themselves and the level of maturity, but uh, certainly seeing very strong returns even from our colleague here from China State and those um, and the Chinese market. Um, the second piece is, is uh, the fear of disruption, I think. If we're relying on the construction market, i.e. the downstream market and the supply chain to change, um, I don't think it'll happen fast enough. I think where it really needs to happen is in the um, is the challenge for clients and the, and clients setting the challenge and, and raising the bar for us as consultants and for contractors and supply chains. Um, we found through Edorat in the UK that actually you know, the, the, the level of savings um, that are there for advanced modular construction are significant as long as supply chain can be used to its full advantage, right? So it's not necessarily taking out the existing supply chain. It's actually working with it and uh, making it uh, advanced modular ready. Um, and I think you'll see a lot of work in that in this area in the, in the years to come. And I think the third piece is, is the, the whole advanced modular. Um, we've been doing this for years in the automobile industry, the aviation industry, in the OE and the, in the dairy industry and the food science. Um, I think it's time now that uh, you know our colleagues in the construction sector uh, learn from that and, and work with, uh, with, with doing it that way. I think uh -huh. maybe and the last point is the, is, the, is the challenges we have around the actual um, form of construction we use. Precast by its nature is heavy. Um, and difficult to work with, um, but I think looking at technology like Dubox have, um, for sure, I can see that being linked up with uh, them. I can see it being linked up with uh, how we actually procure and sell these villas in the first instance, and then also the supply chain in terms of uh, a better way of, of supplying their uh, their materials and equipment into products and factories and, and using it all in a closer industrialized zone as opposed to 
bring it all to site and then expecting skilled and semi-skilled laborers just to pull the thing together. Um, yep. Right. Um, it's good to mention about the supply chain. So geographical wise, uh, Colin, do you think um, the skill gaps uh, plays a role or the geographical location uh, where the technology is implemented, uh, does, does the skill gap affect that or the geographical affect that? Yeah, I think the, uh, you know, in, in the UK, for instance, we, we manage to, with, with close collaboration with the supply chain for a, for a product, we would typically have had to go to four local contract or local supply houses for that product before it would come to what we need. When we uh, skilled overseas in the Far East, it was 20 number was the equivalent number that we would, would need to canvas before we get a product. And I'd imagine that's quite similar to where we are here in the UAE as well. So the supply chain hasn't really turned itself around to uh, offsite manufacture yet. But I think it will come very, very, very quickly. Right. Yeah. Right. I agree with you. Um, thanks a lot, uh, Colin, for this. And uh, my next question to um, uh, Bilal uh, from FAM Holdings. So uh, do you think, Bilal, that... Uh, we are ready now for the digital revolution. So is it still early for some reasons uh, from your experience or we are ready for that move and shift uh, into the construction industry? So what, what's your insights about this? Yeah, thanks so much, Hani. Uh, actually, to be honest, uh, we are not ready yet for this one because uh, to be ready, we, uh, we have to, uh, all the stakeholders, all the parties should be involved 100% because to reach, let's say, uh, the perfect beam world, it's a little tough. And uh, I give you a small example. In, in my company, uh, I got a lot of support from the top management. But uh, in the opposite side, I, I got, uh, let's say, um, our engineers, they didn't support this digital transformation from the CAD workflow, let's say, to uh, beam workflow. So uh, I'm facing a lot of constraints and I'm facing a lot of, let's say, obstacles in my company. If, if I project this to the real world or outside, uh, we are not ready yet. So uh, this, we, we, we need, to, be, uh, we need to, to, to make all the stakeholders involved. Uh, depends on each, each appointed party, uh, depends on the specialist. So uh, all the consultants, all, all the, the contractors, all, all the, let's say, uh, the suppliers, lead appointed party, appointed parties should be involved. Uh, let me add something here for uh, the first question, Mr. Hani, about the, the skill gap. Uh, actually, people, uh, they are using, uh, for example, if I go to site and make a site check-in and all the experts which they are uh, here with us, they know this very well. They are using to check the quality with, let's say, shop drawings, uh, method statement specifications with uh, three uh, set of papers. When we go to site and try to convince them, use the mobile app to check the quality. For example, you have a lot of applications, Beam applications, let's say Trimble and Beam Sync and other applications. They cannot or they are not ready yet to accept this uh, change from, it's it's for them, it's like big jump. Uh, maybe they are afraid, maybe they, they, they their minds, they, they it's 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 uh, very tough because uh, we 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 are suffering uh, with those people. We have to keep going and keep teaching them, training them. Uh, that's why for this uh, small example, without uh, uh, all stakeholders involvement, we cannot that reach that. But it's still still very late, or or we uh, we have to, we have to be together. Yeah, this is my 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 view uh, viewpoint. Right, yeah. and. Um, and whom you think should be responsible for filling this skill gap? Should it be the companies, the government, um, like uh, um, authorities, honest, in, um, institutes, yeah. or from universities? So like, whom shall be responsible for that? From yeah. Uh, uh, from from my perspective, uh, I believe the government they are doing uh, their best to to. Uh, make this, uh, for example, I give you Ajman government, recently they're trying to create a BIM application when everybody, all the developers and the the the, invest, uh, the investors can, can check their, uh, let's say, flats, 
through uh, a Beam application. Uh, like Trimble, as a company or other company uh, who's developing uh, Beam software, they are doing their best. So the problem here, as from my perspective, it's a human 100%. It's a human, one hundred percent, because everybody right. they are doing their best. You know, we we like you see, uh, there is a lot of company trying to develop IFC, let's say viewer or IFC uh, uh, softwares. Uh, the government like Dubai, like Ajman, and recently you know something, Ras Al Khaimah government they are trying to implement Kubi in their system to check uh, in in their facility management. I, re I received recently a Kubi sheet. And they told me, please, Bilal, fill it. So uh, this is good from the government. And for universities, uh, also they're trying their best to uh, make, uh, I mean, this digital transformation, make it in 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 uh, be success. So it's a human, one hundred percent. It's a human. Right. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Um, so my next question to uh, Farid Mansour from China State. So we all come across repetitive work and I would like also to hear after uh, uh, Mr. Farid like from Yasser because I believe you have some good experience in that side and improving the repetitive work through automation and robotic uh, technologies so uh, uh, Mr. Farid so we have uh, repetitive work and we have uh, uh, this repetitive work will impact a lot on the cost of the project this could be like doing things manually uh, 2D or drawings or maybe using um, uh, sheet formats. So how this uh, impacts the industry and how we can avoid the repetitive work uh, from your perspective. Uh, th thank you, Henny. Thanks for linking the repetitive works for the, the automation aspect, because in principle, as, as what Mr. Blas said in his last question, uh, one major characteristic for the, the human being is the imperfectionist. And they are all the time associating with the ability to do errors. Now, uh, if, if we try to, 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 to look after humans which are not making mistakes, we need to look for them outside of this planet. In principle, humans, as long as they are associated with the works, they will keep doing mistakes. And once we put this also in a repetitive pattern, it is also common to find these mistakes coming even in a repetitive pattern, same as how the work is associated to them. So the manual process all the time is inviting errors and inviting mistakes. And the right direction to get out or to get rid out of those mistakes is to cut it from the root, convert the manual process into automated one. Machines does not have the luxury to be able to commit mistakes. And if they commit mistakes because they have been programmed wrongly. So again, it's come back to the human errors which involve uh, on how the machine will commit a mistake. Now, if we take this concept and we outline the construction activities, definitely we have a big rule, though it is a very conservative industry and it has uh, its own principles, which it's hard to change. But again, construction industry still can be split into construction activities, which has a direct link to the construction work on site, and non-construction activities, which unfortunately is the main time killer. Those processes which are not related to the site is what directly lead into time waste and dragging the schedule out. There are a certain big room of improvement which we can introduce to this industry could be shifted from a human effort into a machine daily works. And I would like to give some examples here, like for example, data collection. Data collection could be purely automated process through uh, the sensors and through the devices which could be implemented during the construction activity itself and can collect the data and communicate with other sensors using the huge uh, uh, advancement we have currently in the Internet of Things. And this could be fully automated process. The process of the approval and review this is one of the killers for all the construction schedules. And there is no meaning that this has to be away from the automated process. Why don't we just set up the system and any new system which required to be approved could assign this job to the computer or the automated process just to compare to what it has built in its program and directly give the approval or rejection in seconds. Mm -hmm. Really, there is no time for these papers to wait on engineers table by days and weeks just waiting them to repeat the same review process which they did in some earlier job again and again and again. 
updates, requesting for updates and collection of the updates and updating the schedules. This is one of the tasks which it requires a lot of resources, wasting a lot of time and money, which it can fully be automated and can happen on a real lifetime. You don't need to request for an update. Update should be available with your device all the time from a live field through an automated process. All those aspects could be accumulated together and you can see definitely once this happens, how much time and code saving you can achieve through uh, automating such kind of non-construction activities. Um, great piece of information, Mr. Fred, yeah. to know and thanks for um, commenting on that. And um, also, like I said, I would like to hear from uh, Mr. Yasser if you have uh, something to share with us or talk about when it comes to the uh, automation. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much. I, I re really uh, agree with uh, uh, Farid about everything he said about repetitive works and uh, uh, the impact of uh, uh, the, the, the time uh, where off-site work actually mainly engineering, not the site activities. The engineering work and whatever related to that engineering work is really perceived from the uh, operation team at site. They believe really that this is this is a really waste of time. And it, yes, it is a time a, a time consuming processes, but uh, it is very important to control the, the progress at site and eliminate the errors. It's very important how to to uh, uh, how to convince the operation team to accept that delay at the beginning, then recover back quickly using their tools that they provided to us is really hard. And this is really the cultural shift that we, that I was talking about. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. We in, in Dubox, we established the BIM process in, in, in our system and we were living BIM living BIM literally, and you know that, uh, uh, Hani, because we've been together on this from, from the beginning of, of uh, when we established Dubox. And uh, we used to issue everything out of the 3D coordinated model. Later on, we found that this the site team at site, uh, uh, in the factory actually, not even at site, it's in the factory, that we found that the, the tiles are not as per the design. And we, when we verified why, we found that it uh, it was uh, somehow uh, considered from from the engineer in the factory that yeah we used to do tiling all our life. Why we should read the drawing and do the tiling according to the drawing? Tiling it can be done. We just measure and we know where to start, where to finish. But right. actually, the tiling design, the shop drawing of the tile, considered that the tile line will match the vanity level and will match from the other side the, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the bathtub level. So that was not even considered because they simply believe this is a waste of time and money that give, people are giving us shot drawing of the tiling. So they, they never believe that this is really important. This is a big cultural drop that we have in this area. And this is what I meant by the cultural shift. The cultural shift is not on the high level demand, uh, high level decision making level. No, I'm talking about the, those in the operation even, even the foreman at site, even the, 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 the labor at site should understand what, what we are doing. The site and the factor and, and the yard are the same. So it's very important. We cannot go and talk about 4G, uh, uh, four level of, of industries. And while we are still not, uh, having that, such a big gap between the, the office and the operation at site. This is very important. Otherwise, we will have to continue leaving the, the errors and repeat the errors. And right. uh, it, it's it's very a very important term when we used to say, guys, you have to understand we are not like others. If we don't follow what we are spending our life on in the 3D modeling and, and, and the, uh, the design period, we will end up demolishing contractors. We will not be uh, uh, just more modular construction. We will be demolishing contractors and we face it in one of the projects really. So this is really important. Right, um, I, I do really much appreciate your passion about like resolving uh, construction industry problems and the way how you're very keen to find solutions and ways to overcome that. So uh, we mentioned about the automation and also the communication was part of uh, Farid Mansour's uh, conversation and the data collection and how this uh, impacts the uh, 
the, the delivery of the project. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, what are the shortfalls that we have in the communication at the moment? You talked about that already. And how do you think we can avoid uh, these shortfalls in the communication? Uh, I think uh, uh, Bilal uh, mentioned it uh, uh, when he said that uh, people, when we, when we are inviting people to use the tablets to control and, and, and to check what, they, what happens outside, they, they found it kind of a luxury. Uh, the communication, we're not talking about only the government. The government are doing their bit, they, are, they put regulations, but maybe they are falling the, the point of implementing or let's say imposing those regulations. They are putting regulations, but they are leaving it to the to the uh, industry operators to decide to go for that or not to go for it. But right. they are not imposing it. How, however, we can we things come uh, in steps and stages. We understand that. But I, again, I say we are industry stakeholders. We should work on this communication internally first. Within the, within, within the organization, uh, organization itself, uh, as I said, the example of the tiling shot rocks, uh, uh, it's very important. Communication starts with in, in, in gearing up, training the team, how to understand the, the process, uh, what, what are the advantages, let them feel it. And this is what we try to, to do. Uh, we, we try to tell them uh, the difference, we compare them. We can put a, period, a part of the project where we followed a system and part of it where we, we did not follow the project and we should. We used to do that almost every every fortnight. We, we used to communicate with these guys. Internal communication is very important. Then we talk about the rest. Once that communication, once we built the structures, uh, the, sorry, the cultural shift, the cultural, the mentality of using the tools where un under the BIM, the BIM is not only about drawing, about detailing. The BIM is it, it, it now it, it talks about the big data handling, uh, the, the blockchain, and later on it goes through the whole process of, of uh, operation. Uh, and I believe there are fantastic tools. Our technology is very good and, and, and it's helping us to, to, to uh, uh, implement such uh, 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 methodologies and such, I, I always call the BIM, again, it's a cultural uh, uh, mentality uh, rather than being a process itself. Because it, right. if you don't believe in that process, if you, if you don't have that culture, you will not use that process. Simple, as yeah. simple as that. So right, it's very right. important to build that communication within the organizations themselves. This is the duty of the, the stakeholders, management, and, 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 and the team around. I agree. Thanks a lot, uh, Yasser, for uh, sharing this uh, information with us. Um, Colin? Uh, to be honest, like I was uh, really inspired by your role and um, it's like the shift and move from one way of working to another way. I'm sure you came across different um, uh, planning for how to make this shift um, and how to change the way how are we currently working for the sake of uh, making profits and optimizing the workflows and uh, making the, the work smooth and uh, easy enough to reach the delivery on time within budget and all that. So from your experience, like where do we begin? So there is an innovation, there is a technology, there is uh, there are tools, uh, but where should be the start of doing that shift? Um, from my experience, it's, it's at the very, very beginning and it's the owner. Um, very often what's blocking us is the expectation or the mindset of the owner in terms of embracing a, a new way of working, right? Um, we, we need to educate owners as to what they can get and what they can achieve out of the market and not just what is the status quo. Um, and I think we all own it as an industry to, to innovate more on, on that basis. Um, I firmly believe, I mean, I, I started out drawing houses for people on a drawing board with pen and ink. And it took me the best part of 10 years just to innovate the CAD, just to change the mindset. Um, and I think it, it does take time, but we ought to, the owners of the buildings we designed to actually give them a better way of work, give them a, a, a zero snag building that is manufactured in a safe environment through a, an automated process. And when I say automated, I don't mean automate to remove people. I, I mean automate to improve people's lives. Yeah. Uh, improve products, 
improve sustainability, net zero campaigns and the like. Um, for for me, I struggle with the 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 reason why we can't manufacture uh, sustainable products next to uh, do boxes prefab yard in 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 Dubai. I, I struggle with 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 why we can't. I struggle with why we can't make uh, the earthenware and the ceramics close by in, in in a way that we don't have the challenge with the the lines for tiling that we spoke about. Um, seeing as we're making these products anyway, right? I just don't know why we can't as a supply chain make them good for a, a standard uh, prototype filler, and then add in on site the, um, the the client's need, right? So instead of it being the standard carcass or frame and ceiling and above ceiling work, where we should be really innovating is is giving the um, the owner of that said villa a better quality kitchen to his exact his or her needs, um, as opposed to having to uh, work with standard carcasses and, and, and things. And um, so I, I believe there is a there's an area of the villa that can be standardized, and then there's an area that should be uh, personalized. And um, I think that's that's where we need to add value to the industry. To be honest, um, we're working with government in Abu Dhabi. We're working with uh, government regulators, Abu Dhabi Housing Authority, rewriting their standards um, to ensure we can do this. Um, working with government to mandate the advanced methods of of manufacture and construction. Um, and I think it's at that level that we will we will have to drive the change um, and give give the owners of these villas uh, something better than a standard uh, traditional type of construction. And that's not to, not that's not to get rid of traditional. There is a time and place for traditional as well. Yeah? So it's not to kill off an industry. It's to it's to innovate it and modernize it. Um, right. In, in, a, in a safe. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. Like uh, when it comes to your role as uh, one of the companies and leading in the uh, construction, um, in the design phase of the projects, and also like you work a lot with the clients. Uh, so yes, uh, this should be one of the ways to begin with is the clients, as you mentioned before. And uh, Atkins has and and will uh, play a, um, a a big role in in uh, doing that happen and making that happen because. The, the the connection between the consultants and the owners are always tight more than how it is when it comes to the construction side itself. So if the learning and um, entering this to the industry from uh, the very beginning, the top bottom approach, it's the best way uh, for the implementation. I really agree with you uh, when it comes to that. So my next question to, uh, yeah. All right, so my, my next question to uh, Paul Wallet. Um, you have a vast experience um, in um, educating the markets on what sort of solutions and tools um, at different stages and levels of the project could be with the owners, could be with the uh, consultants, subcontractors um, as a special area. So what do you think uh, can be the uh, different technologies that we can uh, introduced to the markets, uh, what sort of tools and solutions can be prioritized when it comes to uh, implementing the um, innovation in the construction industry offsite and uh, fabrication level. So um, tell us about your experience and what could be the different solutions for this. Yeah, thanks, Hani. Um, yeah, well, you know, as we've heard on the, the different contributions from the panel, um, Number one, you know, the AEC industry is complex, so we're catering for lots of different types of construction, um, and there's a lot of different uh, contractors, subcontractors involved, the suppliers. So you know, you've got the main contractor and then supply chain. Um, so that that's one part that you know we need to make ensure we have technologies and solutions that can provide the right level of detail. Um, because when we connect the digital and, you know, everybody's been ex uh, exposed to building information modeling now for some years, um, I think what we need to ensure is that you've got, you know, a high level of detail in the models that you're producing so that you know when you go to site that these are well federated, coordinated, um, and, you know, they go together and fit on site. So that's why... When we look at off-site construction, you're ensuring that um, actually in the, the manufacturing plant, 
so you don't have the transport costs you know get to site and find things that don't fit together so you're you're actually helping that process in in the first way in terms of methodology um the other part that you know we hear and have been hearing is about communication is that communication is a key um because you know we things will come across you know you may find that there are some challenges unforeseen challenges but the earlier you can communicate those and make those adjustments then the quicker you can solve those problems and minimize the cost impact on you know supply of new materials or a delay on the schedule um, so having the right manufacturing content having the right communication tools and having the right level of modeling capability connected if you've got automation as well you want to be able to you know automate those processes um, these these are going to you know be the the key areas that people need to really look at investing in um, to enable that they can have success um, so you know communication is ha having manufacturers content for instance on a cloud um, and because we know that with sustainability new technologies come in you know that's another area that we're driving towards but you want to be able to get access to those as instantaneously as possible so that you can download the real manufacturing content into the the type of construction that you're uh, actually facilitating as well so it's a, it's a number of different things it's not one type of technology it's a mix mix of different technologies supporting each other right if you if you choose between automation communication education like education means um, increasing the level of the skills that we're currently having so how do you prioritize them like uh, which comes first like or all of them at the same time or uh, so what, what what do you think like communication automation education well as we heard from yasser i mean education is one of the key things because as we said, you know, we've got great technologies and there's many to choose from. But if you don't educate your workforce into why are we doing something specifically and they go off on their own path thinking, you know, I've been doing this for the last 30 years, 20 years, whatever. You know, nobody can tell me I'm doing my job wrong. They don't, they're not seeing the big picture. So we have to educate on why, why are we doing these things? What, you know, why, why are we changing our processes? And that if you don't, play a role in that, you will actually impact that change across our organization. So I think it's, you know, education certainly is, is a priority there to help educate your team, your workforce. Why are we going down modularization, for example, or, you know, off-site construction? What are the benefits to our organization? This is a must. We have to do this because if we don't, then you could be that one person that's playing, you know, the role going against uh, the flow of where we're going. So that is, you know, one of the key priorities, I would say, uh, amongst all is, is ensuring that we're educating. Um, and then, you know, we've got, as I said at the very beginning, we've got a lot of people who will be leaving out of the industry and, and new people coming in. So we need to be, as providers of these technologies, we need to be providing that new workforce that insight, that tools, those technologies at an educational level, you know, providing programs, providing our solutions for people to experience how, the, you know, the new evolution of construction is going on. Right. Um, that's absolutely right. Paul Wallitson, I agree with you um, uh, when it comes to the uh, priority. All of them are important. Uh, education is a very keen thing um, with, with the technology, uh, with the automation. So. Uh, we have to be well educated and i'll link this to uh, my next question to uh, uh, farid mansoor from china state uh, when it comes to the uh, government and the mandates uh, so it's a vital step um, for the government uh, looking after to build a smart infrastructure uh, for uh, the construction to drive the industry forward in terms of the asset management um, the off-site construction and maintaining the life cycle of any uh, project so what steps, in your view, should be taken to stay on top of such mandates and requirements? Okay, we are speaking about the role of government and uh, 
And if, if we they... look worldwide, we look worldwide for those markets which were known to be well advanced in the construction industry, for example, like here in UAE, for example, like UK, for example, like Singapore, it's evident that the government is a driver. And government vision is the one which lead the markets toward the direction and destination they would like to reach. Government, if we speak about the role of the government, I can see them acting actually in, in, in two ways. One way about the facilitator, which need to build the infrastructure and make the entire community ready to receive the technology. This is one role, this is like an active player where they are doing the work by themselves. And the other role is about the uh, regulator, which put the regulation and put the setup, which can allow others also to grow within this same vision and the same direction. I believe the more the, the government focus on their role as a regulator, the more outcome will come because this will invite the part to be engaged along with them and drive in the same way. Maybe in back of my mind, I, I can think about some, some ideas or some some steps could be taken by government to to facilitate, especially the offside fabrication and and, and particularly automation. Also, maybe one, one of those ideas is to pre-approve some systems and to have those systems pre-approved in the setup of government. So those systems does not require to go again through the approval process. One example I can give here, we all see during the early days of this pandemic when they, they built this hospital in Haoshenshen in China in 10 days. We all saw some time-lapse videos and we were all amazed about how this could happen in such short time. The key point behind this is all the system was already pre-approved from different manufacturers, from different suppliers and the system of the government itself. So there was no time which we need to go and, and, and repeat the process which done early days before, and at that time, if we need to engage as much supplier as we wish, we have the ability. All of them following the same regulation of a pre-approved system. So pre-approving system and keeping them ready in the database, this is a key. This also will encourage those existing suppliers and new ones to come and enroll their system within the current regulation of the government and get them also approved. I believe one key factor also is to, to widen the acceptance criteria for, for other codes and regulations rather than the existing ones. We all know that Asian countries like China, like Japan, like Korea are very active in the, uh, on the off-site fabrication. They have their own systems. They follow their own regulation and standard and those standards are proven. So it it's could be one good idea is to widen the aspect of accepting those standards and regulation from those countries as well. This helped to invite more suppliers to come here and invest their, their system within the country here. To organize a local research between different suppliers and between whoever, maybe academic institute mm -hmm. also develop a locally fit uh, off-site fabrication system match the requirement of the environment of the uh, UAE here. This also could be a great aspect which could help uh, the, the, the industry to grow. Maybe one last point, and this is quite important, I think we missed to talk about this, is about the perception of the local market here towards the off-site fabrication. Unfortunately, there is some wrong perception that if we talk about off-site fabrication, then we are talking about a low-quality product following some communism aspect and so. So this is like a Borta cabin. It's not gonna be like a good building same like the conventional do. I believe this requires awareness campaigns, which need to be driven by government. So let the people themselves, starting from the end users, the one which will be using this building first to get convinced that this is the right thing for them. That by default will drive the developers, the consultants, the contractors to follow them because this is what the end users are looking for. I believe this last point is quite crucial and if, if government puts some effort on that more, this will help this industry to, to grow up more and more here within the region we have. Yeah, absolutely right. So uh, we're all looking after the government and we're trying to make um, uh, a tight and <clears throat> open open conversation with uh, those entities because they uh, definitely, and we agree all on that, play a big role in making that happen. Um, my question before the last one uh, to Colin, I know that uh, uh, you have uh, another commitment after this meeting. Um, uh, at any point of time, feel free to... Um, um, uh, engage with uh, the other commitment if so 
but my last question for you is um, um, how do you think that the construction is often referred uh, to, uh, to as a next in line to fishing in terms of the innovation? I took the quote from a McKinsey report I read recently, so don't blame me if it's not right. Um, I think, as I said, my introduction to MMC was 12 years ago in a, in a, in a factory built in Ringeskiri in Cork, where they were actually shipping 500, 550 units of housing a year to the UK market, right? Um, and the the chap that built that factory ultimately started out in the reinforced concrete business, building um, uh, tanks and slatted houses for agriculture. Um, and that's going back, and, and where he was making them in precast, that's going back 25 years. Um, have we innovated ourselves past that today, where you can literally uh, become the Amazon Prime, um, i.e. next day delivery for a villa? Um, absolutely not. I think we're a long, long ways away from that. But I would ask a reason. I mean, I would ask everyone in, involved in the construction market, why is it that we're not there? Because every other market we're in is. Um, so I think there's a there's a big ask of where we are and, and where we need to get to. Um, I, our colleague Farid, I, I echo your sentiment. Where can the change happen? Um, I sat on a supplier briefing call last um, April, which was during COVID, where the speaker mentioned the fact that with government intervention between the government of the US, China and America, they were able to build um, a brand new mask production factory in Alain for masks within 30 days. So I think if, if the motivation is there at government level and it's, it's a mandated requirement, then everybody else will toe the line and get there in the end. But I think that's really where the where the cusp of this will happen. And I would I would ask government to really challenge our industry and challenge challenge us and challenge Atkins and challenge Atkins teams to make it more efficient. Um, I, I mean I'm I'm leaving the call today to go to Rack to speak with a contractor around how we can actually modularize his his uh, his project and deliver it uh, within 12 months. He's currently got an 18 month construction schedule and actually not take not take any of the of the profit or the cost or the revenue away from the guy just to make it easier, make it safer and make it easier for everyone to 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 uh, to deliver on that. So um, I think we owe it all to ourselves to challenge everybody else in, in, in the room um, and, and, and our colleagues. Yeah. Uh, we'll be looking after later on to uh, hear from you on how that goes with uh, this project, maybe in the future conversations. And uh, the last question to, um, it's not my question or the question that we put in the panel. Uh, it's a question we spoke about like offline. Uh, Mr. Yasser uh, wanted to also interact with the speakers here in the panel. And um, he has a question to uh, Paul, if you don't mind, um, like how Tremble addresses the uh, software readiness to facilitate automation in construction. So do you have any comments before that, Mr. Um, uh, yes, sir, that you would like to rephrase the question and put it different? Well, uh, well, actually, this question uh, has another another perspective built in. Uh, we've been talking about the, the human factor in the construction industry, and we, we, we have now the tools to automate the designs, and, and the design is somehow we have the, the, those tools. But the actual work at site there is no initiative, there is no real uh, uh, move in automation uh, uh, implementation in the construction industry with the exception to the precast itself. What we have been working for the last two years, or actually two and a half years in B3G is to uh, uh, design a, a fully automated robotic modular construction. This design is now uh, uh, in the last stage of the schematic uh, uh, design and where we, we entered now in designing the machines. Uh, uh, they are robots and, and they, they, take BIM, they take BIM in material and they get modules out with three times the capacity that, that we have in Newbox today 
uh, uh, with 80% lesser in manufacturing. Now, the question is, Trimble used to be the leader in, in providing the tools for the industry. Now, they, they were very, uh, we, we all know them about their, their tools in design, and they, we know their uh, ability to work with uh, uh, precast manufacturers for CNC machines and similar ones and steel manufacturers as well. But has anybody thought of the readiness of the tools for full modular building construction, fully, fully done by, by robots, or, or let's say to go to the next level of, of industrial generation? What, what are we talking about here? Have we, have we thought of it? Have we worked on it? I would love to, to collaborate with you in, in this, if, if, if there's a, 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 a plan for this. Yeah, it's, it, it is a, a big change in the industry that we are seeing. And across Trimble, you know, what, what we really focus on is connecting that digital world to the physical world. Um, and what, we're, you know, what we have is kind of the manufacturing level uh, work which you've mentioned so if we talk about the precast we have the cycle plants and how we can download the digital data to the machines um, that are you know shooting out lasers or you know positioning certain components so that has been something that's been in our technology for a long time you know, using you know special ways of connecting to the machinery both from the precast and structural uh, side as well the, the next ev evolution that we're talking about, which is a bit different to what you're talking about there, Yasser, is you know, we're looking at machine connectivity. So where we're looking at machine control. So we have that level of capability where we can, if we look at the very early stages of the earthworks, preparing the site, we have the ability to download the, uh, the digital data map of where we should be doing the cut and fill and the machines uh, actually can go on their own with no intervention from the controller. It can actually drive and track the machine where it needs to go and how deep it needs to grade or if this is an area of fill. Um, so we have those uh, connectivity tools um, that enable you to fully automate that process. Um, then what we're talking a bit more about there is the, I guess the 3D printing is kind of close to what you're talking, where we can download the data uh, in terms of a, an intelligent file and take that into the machine and then it can do the 3D printing. Um, the other aspects that we're working on is a, a collaboration with Boston Dynamics and Hilti, where we have the robot that you know you may have seen which has a Trimble payload being our technology seated on top of that robot, where it can actually do repetitive tasks, whether it's laser scanning or positioning for layout. Uh, it can remotely go through the site unattended, uh, do its work, come back to its charging station, and then the next day it can repeat that task if it's repetitive. So if we're looking at um, a lot of the complex projects where they do um, schedule validation. So they'll do laser scans to see what have we done today in accordance to the plan and then they'll actually do a digital uh, 3D laser scan of that uh, work and then they'll match it to the as designed uh, against as built. So that's uh, a validation of where we are progressing through the work. So there are lots of different technologies, it's just you know how can we come together in your particular case, in, in this instance, and how can we collaborate uh, with our technologies? So I'm not saying it's not possible, it is entirely feasible to do many different things. It's what, you know, is the case use, and then how we can apply the vast amount of different sensory technologies that we have to do the data collection and link that through to the machinery in, it, in, its, in itself. Um. Thanks a lot, Paul okay. for answering the question. And um, I would like to uh, especially thank everyone in the panel here, uh, starting from uh, uh, Mr. Farid Mansour, China State, uh, with your uh, passionate in the engineering design and construction with uh, China State. 
and uh, your initiatives uh, to improve the way how the construction uh, gets better in the industry. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Colin, uh, like I said, uh, I'm, I'm really inspired with uh, your role and how uh, you are making that change and putting a plan for that change and working with different players and parties uh, into the construction side. Uh, Bilal, uh, coming from the technical uh, managerial uh, background and how uh, BIM is implemented within your company and uh, your ideas and thoughts about uh, the challenges that were uh, coming across uh, for the industry. Uh, Paul Wallet, with your long experience in the um, uh, solution uh, technology to the construction industry. Uh, Yasser Bahaj with a vast experience in the off-site construction and the modular construction. Uh, thanks a lot, everybody, for sharing your ideas and thoughts about uh, the off-site construction communication and automation today. And um, uh, for that, I'd like to thank everybody from the audience. And I hope that you have learned uh, something today from the panel discussion and the uh, round table that we had. I'm sure that there is something that you will take away um, to tell your company about from the stories that we heard today from all the speakers here. Like I said before, this is not the last uh, roundtable discussion that we're going to have. Uh, you could be one of those who are invited to the roundtable discussion. So let us know if you are interested. We will be holding more and more in the future. Uh, thanks, everybody and everyone for listening to the roundtable discussion today. Um, the speakers on behalf of them and myself, Hani Salah, I would like to thank everybody and um, have a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.